Hi. Today we're looking at a fascinating topic. It's the role of omega-3 supplements in health. We're looking at the question, should you take omega-3 supplements? Before we get started, I'm excited to invite you to a course I'll be teaching, 30-day crash course on what to eat and how to prepare it. This course is designed for busy professionals who want to know what to eat and how to prepare it. Please check it out. The link is below. The study we're examining was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in January 2019. The New England Journal of Medicine has an impact factor of 91, making it one of the most respected journals in the world and helping us have confidence in the study's findings. This was a primary prevention study of whether or not omega-3s affected risk of heart disease and cancer. Primary prevention means that the people didn't already have heart disease or cancer when they entered the trial. They were general population. Let's get some background first of all. So what are omega-3s? There are three major forms of omega-3s that come from the diet. Plant sources, land plants, and then marine sources. The plant sources from the land are primarily alpha linoleic acid, and sources from the sea are primarily EPA and DHA. Alpha linoleic acid from plants comes from foods such as walnuts, chia seeds. EPA and DHA come from foods like, well, I remember them as smash tea. Salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, herring, and trout. To a certain extent, alpha linoleic acid is converted into EPA and DHA in the human body, but the extent to which this is happens varies between individuals and is not a significant contributor of EPA and DHA in the diet. There is also, of course, supplements that people take from fish oil and krill oil. Most of the clinical benefit attributed to omega-3s is from EPA and DHA, the marine sources, rather than the plant sources or the land plant sources. What is already known about omega-3s in health? We know that from animal studies and from laboratory studies and from small trials of intermediate clinical outcomes, omega-3s have a role in a variety of areas. From these studies, we know that omega-3s can lower triglycerides, that they can decrease the risk for abnormal heart rhythms or arrhythmias, that through nitric oxide, they can cause relaxation of the endothelium or the lining of arteries, thus decreasing blood pressure. Omega-3s can play a role in reducing the risk of thrombosis or clots, and as well as decrease the progression of atherosclerosis or plaques. In terms of clinical outcomes, we know that in secondary prevention, for people who already have had a heart attack or a stroke, taking omega-3s shows inconsistent results. Some studies show benefits, some studies do not. And there is very little data in primary prevention. What role, if any, omega-3s have in people who don't already have heart disease or stroke? This study comes in at that point where we're looking at individuals without prior heart disease or stroke, and we're looking at an outcome, whether or not there's a, an effect on major cardiovascular events, or invasive cancer. So this study was a randomized placebo-controlled trial. There were 25,871 participants, and they were followed for 5.3 years. Half of the group was given a daily supplement of omega-3s, one gram dosing, and the other was given a sugar pill. And the researchers uh, did a baseline questionnaire of clinical risk factors and lifestyle factors. They did an initial blood sample uh, to look at the levels of omega-3s in the blood at baseline and at one-year follow-up. 
And then they looked at clinical outcomes, what happened to the individuals during the 5.3 year follow-up period. Let's look at the study results. This is absolutely fascinating. It's a power of statistics. The primary endpoint for this trial was a major cardiovascular event, which is a stroke, a heart attack, or death from any cardiovascular cause, a composite, and invasive cancer. They compared the intervention group, the ones who took omega-3s, with the placebo group, sugar pill. And they looked at the hazard ratio. Hazard ratio is the risk of the outcome based on the status. So a hazard ratio less than one, as seen for major cardiovascular event, means that there's an 8% lower risk of a major cardiovascular event from in the group that took omega-3s. But it's not enough to take the hazard ratio because you have to look at two statistical measures. This is a sample, it's not the whole population. And the, the validity of a sample in predicting what you would get if you looked at the whole population is measured as a 95% confidence interval and a p-value. The 95% confidence interval should not cross one. If it crosses one, then the groups are the same. In this example, the 95% confidence interval crosses one, which means that we can't really believe in this 8% reduction in major cardiovascular event. Furthermore, the p-value is greater than 0.05. This is the chance that these results happen randomly. So both indicators of the quality of these, of this result suggest we can't believe it. The groups are no different. Omega-3s did not affect major cardiovascular events. Here's the question of invasive cancer. The hazard ratio is 1.03, which would suggest that taking omega-3s would actually increase your risk of cancer compared to not taking them. But the confidence interval can't cross one for us to believe these findings, and it does, 0.93 to 1.13. So we have reason to doubt this increased risk from omega-3s. Furthermore, the p-value is greater than 0.05, so there's a 56% chance that this result is a random occurrence, which means that omega-3s did not affect major cardiovascular events or invasive cancer. That was the primary endpoint of the study. It gets super interesting though. I'm gonna show you three tables which we need to interpret with caution. The reason we need to interpret it with caution is because the only results we can have full confidence in are the primary endpoints, major cardiovascular events and invasive cancers. When we look at secondary endpoints, in this study they didn't calculate a p-value, which means that we're missing one of the criteria we need to have confidence in the findings, which means that even if we have a low hazard ratio, even if the confidence interval doesn't cross one, we still can't be certain of the findings. So what's interesting is that in the secondary analysis, the risk of total myocardial infarction was lower in the omega-3 group, but there's no p-value. So we can't be sure that this is valid. So that's suggestive that total myocardial infarction was lower, but not good enough because we don't have a p-value measured. The other interesting result was death from myocardial infarction. 50% lower in the omega-3 group, confidence interval doesn't cross one, but we still haven't calculated a p-value, so we can't be sure that these results are valid in the real world. So, so far we've, de we've determined that our primary endpoint for which we have a p-value and a confidence interval shows no difference when you take omega-3s. When you look at the secondary endpoint of heart attack and death from heart attack, you do have a lowering of risk in the group that took omega-3s, and you have a confidence interval that doesn't cross one, but you don't have a p-value, it hasn't been calculated for this study. So you, you have to take these findings with a grain of salt. Let's look at the second of the three tables. 
In this second table, we're looking at a subgroup analysis. We know that major cardiovascular events are no different whether or not you take a omega-3 supplement. But is there, are there, is there a subgroup who actually benefits from omega-3s, even though the whole group of people who were assigned to it didn't? Now, we are looking for a hazard ratio that doesn't cross one, and the p-value is less than 0.05. The only subgroup that had a benefit from taking omega-3s were people who ate less than one and a half servings of fish per week at baseline before they started. So if you were someone who did not consume fish regularly, then you actually benefited. You had a lower cardiovascular event risk. The confidence interval didn't cross one and the p-value was less than 0.05. This is super interesting. This suggests that though you don't benefit from omega-3s if you already eat fish, you do benefit if at baseline you don't eat fish. One more table I want to show you is total mortality. Total mortality is the gold standard for these intervention trials. If, some, if in the end people have a lower risk of mortality, not just cancer mortality or heart disease mortality, then we have the strongest reason to support that intervention. The researchers found that total mortality was not affected by taking omega-3s. But the question remains, what about the group who wasn't eating, eating fish at baseline? Did they have a total mortality that was reduced with a 95% confidence interval that didn't cross one and a p-value of less than 0.05? Let's take a look. So here we have the total mortality, and we're comparing the group that was eating less than 1.5 servings of fish per week at baseline. They had a 13% lower risk of all-cause mortality. The p-value was less than 0.05, but the confidence interval crossed one. So we can't have confidence that there was actually a reduced risk of total mortality. So in, in conclusion, this study failed to show that there was a reduced risk of major cardiovascular event or invasive cancer in the group that supplemented with omega-3s. For secondary endpoints for which we can have less confidence, omega-3s did result in lower risk of myocardial infarction and lower risk of death from myocardial infarction. Though because it was a secondary analysis and did not include p-values, the, this can only be taken as a hypothesis that, these, that omega-3s had this effect. Further study is needed to confirm those findings. Furthermore, in terms of the primary outcome of major cardiovascular event, there was a significantly decreased risk for people who did not consume fish at baseline. So the overall takeaway from this study is that there is a potential benefit for the whole population in taking omega-3s, but that requires further study. And there is more than likely a benefit from supplementing with omega-3s in terms of reducing heart attacks and death from heart attacks for those who do not eat fish. What can we take from this study? The, the evidence for health benefits of omega-3s are not overwhelming. I, until I read this study, was supplementing with omega-3s and consuming two servings of omega-3 rich seafood per week. After this study, I'm no longer gonna be supplementing with omega-3s. I will continue to eat salmon twice a week, though it is not a slam dunk for health benefit. This study shows merely a suggestion of benefit and no obvious harm. This is gonna be part of a course I'm teaching starting in September, I welcome you to check it out. The seats are limited, so please do so soon. In this course, we're gonna talk about what to eat based on the best evidence and how to prepare it. It's gonna be great. You don't have to know a thing about cooking to uh, participate and get a lot out of it and to become an all-star in the kitchen. Thank you.